welcome to this roundtable. Uh, this unique roundtable today will be on World UX, bringing design, content, and localization together. My name is Priscilla Charles, and I'm delighted to be here today. And first, I would like to start with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the roundtable will start in a few moments and will be moderated by Maria Jesus de Arriba Diaz of Vistatech. We will have a few minutes, of course, for a Q&A towards the end of today's webinar. So please, uh, webinar roundtable, should I say, please feel free to use the Q&A button uh, to enter any questions you may have for our panelists today. And I would like to invite you to do it throughout the presentation as you think of them. Um, it helps if they don't come at the end. And also, if you're using the chat, please note that you can select your message, uh, who your message goes to. So select panelists and attendees to chat to other attendees. Otherwise, only the panelists and I get to see the, your greetings and comments, so it will be helpful. And also uh, use the chat for any, any technical queries you might have, and I'll be in touch to answer them. So if you're joining us today here live, well, thanks very much indeed for your time. And if you're listening to this recording, thanks for listening. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Maria, who will introduce the roundtable and all of our panelists. So over to you, Maria. Thank you, Priscilla. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. You're very welcome to this World UX Roundtable. Although we have been talking about UX and specifically international UX for quite some time, this conversation is critical today more than ever before. The new global reality has triggered an unprecedented digital acceleration for businesses across every industry. Today, more than ever, companies need to become digital first to survive. And with that, it is crucial that those global digital experiences are comparable to the native user experiences. Successful digital forward businesses put CX and UX first and embed global readiness into both elements. This is World UX. And in this round table, we're going to discuss the why, the what, and the how of World UX. As Priscilla said, please feel free to ask any questions uh, or add any questions uh, with the Q&A button. And we're gonna have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So first of all, I would like to give a very warm welcome to Tarja, Sergio, Pat, Alberto and Ryan. And a special thanks to Ryan. He is in Seoul in Korea and it's quite late in the evening for him. Thank you for being part of this round table and welcome. I'm going to um, briefly introduce our panelists today, and then we're going to um, also ask for a little bit of information about you, the audience here with us um, this afternoon. So first off, Tarja Karjalainen, she's the Localization Program Manager at Aura and is based in Finland. She's a longtime advocate of international UX and CX. She has previously led a team of UX writers and localization managers and has also run international UX driven localization programs. She features in many industry blogs, podcasts, webinars, and she's also a regular speaker at Lockworld. And you may not know that Tarja's favorite time of the year is Christmas, and she loves to make unusual gingerbread houses. This year, she plans on making a gingerbread cuckoo clock. Welcome, Tarja. Thank you so much. <laughs> Next is Sergio Valero Notari. He's the UX writing manager at Doctoralia in Barcelona. And he's also an online teacher with Creana, uh, where he has created the first UX writing online course in Spanish. He's also offline lecturer and assistant professor on content strategy and UX writing also in Barcelona. And Sergio loves to work listening to Final Fantasy and epic music tracks. He then feels like he's riding a dragon and throwing fire, just that with words. And when a song with any lyrics pops out, mm -hmm. trans stage is finished. Next up, <laughs> hi <laughs> Sergio, sorry. Hi. <laughs> Next up is Pat Higgins, his localization lead at Verizon Connect in Dublin. And Pat's experience in the localization industry spans over two decades. He started as an engineer with Microsoft and he's been a long-term champion of the UX and localization overlap and the importance of written content, quality written content for both. 
In his spare time, Pat makes liquors um, where he adds spirits, gin or vodka, some sugar or sugar syrup and flavorings such as fruits or herbs. So, you know, I think I, I can see a side business here um, for, for Pat. So looking forward to um, when we can meet again and maybe taste <laughs> some of those uh, lovely liquors. Welcome, Pat. Thank you very much. Next is Ryan, Ryan Moraz. He's the head of UX localization at Line in Seoul, Korea. And he holds what many of us are certainly, I consider the ideal role. And um, he oversees both UX writing and localization for the global messaging app, uh, which is used by over 200 million people and leads a team of linguists, microcopy experts and storytellers. And again, Ryan, similar to, to um, uh, Sergio, he loves music as well. He has seen hundreds of bands perform. He has occasionally even crossed the world just to see certain concerts and not being able to see live music is his biggest complaint about the coronavirus era. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. And last but not least, we have Alberto Freira. He's user research manager at Vodafone in London. He's also the author of Universal UX Design, uh, Building Multicultural Experience, uh, a reference must read in this particular topic. He's also a guest lecturer as part of the User Experience Design uh, Master of Science at Kingston University in the UK. And Alberto is passionate about cinema. He has done theater in the past and is actually working on a screenplay about a Jesuit priest in war-torn Afghanistan. Welcome, Alberto. Thank you very much. Thank you very much once again for being here, for taking part in the roundtable. Um, to everybody who's joining us live today, we would love to know um, where you're coming from, your background, uh, where you are in your journey, your awareness um, of, of UX and localization, what we've come to call world UX. So you're, you're gonna see a poll popping up on your screen in just a few moments. And we'd really appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to fill it in. So I think we have that poll. Okay. Perfect. In the meantime, while you fill in the poll in your own time, we're going to turn over to our panel and ask them to share their experience, their journey, and specifically, why do they believe that it is key that UX design slash UX research and UX content writing and localization come together? So Pat, I'm, I'm gonna start with you if that's okay. Yep. with your 20 years experience in the industry. All right, thanks, Maria. Hi, everyone. Um, so I started in the Loke industry um, back in 97. Um, I was QA vendor for a while and then joined Microsoft as an engineer for about 14 years. It's 16 if you include some contracting time. Uh, when I left Microsoft, I was working in Office, which means we were localizing in about 100 languages. The last six years have been with Verizon Connect, um, the role there is just um, the usual translation stuff and then investigating uh, requirements for going into new countries and then you're talking to the devs about requirements for basically to prevent issues before they happen. Everybody knows prevention is better and cheaper. Um, and so I think working with the devs to prevent stuff got my interest going in design. And then also with the text that we had to translate, sometimes we didn't have writers at the time, so some of the text wasn't the best. And so that got my interest in writing. And so I did some online courses for that. You looked into um, natural control languages, that sort of thing. Basically any kind of rule that would help me, guide me uh, in getting better English text so that we had a better source for the translations, you know, simplify the text, lower the reading level, less technical terms, unless it's industry specific, that sort of stuff. So that's where my interests in these areas have grown. And so why these three together? Uh, for me, they're all about creating the best design um, for the widest number of potential users, really. Um, they each have a different starting point, but they all have the same destination. Um, they take a different path to that same destination and they perhaps face different problems, but they all have the common goal 
of trying to create that better product for, for the huge number of users that we expect and that we want. Um, UX will bring the design, that's the fix. Uh, it's the solution to their problem and that's great. But then content can sharpen that and clarify. It shows what to do, how to do it, when to do it, where to do it. Because sometimes an icon on its own won't explain a, an issue and you need the text. And then I feel that localization can help bring a wider world view to perhaps the other two disciplines that don't have that view. Uh, in the way a UX person might say, okay, this works for desktop, but not for mobile, uh, but we need both. Uh, the localization person says, well, this works in English, but not French. It works for Western Europe, but not Eastern Europe. It works for Japanese and Chinese, but it won't work for Baidai. And you can be in the business of making the best product, but it is a business. And to get paid, you have to have something that users want. And so our job is to tell designers, you know, change X to Y to fix your issue. And it appeals to more people. So for me, all these three disciplines are needed to create the even better product for your customer, wherever they are, whatever their culture, whatever their language, and whatever currency they're paying you in. Um, these three groups are the world UX, and they create the world product for the world user. And that's how I look at it. Great. Thank you, Pat. Taj, from your perspective, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, you've been a uh, uh, similar to Pat, a kind of a, a long time advocate. Why is it important, key, that these three elements come together? Yeah, um, well, I, I mean, I've been managing localization from this uh, quite a wide perspective for, for a while now. Uh, and I've shifted, I, I started as a translator myself, and then I've been a UX writer, I've been on the vendor side, I've tried all these uh, different hats. Um, and now I've Lately, I've been shifting from looking at just the UI or, or a website to looking at experiences, international experiences, and looking at the entire user experience of a product. So it's about the whole journey the customer sees and experiences. And from the localization po manager's point of view, it's really, really easy to see where the international user gets kind of forgotten. Uh, because that's where the language support usually usually uh, ends. But then, you know, there are parts of the journey where you might not uh, offer support in multiple languages, or you have neglected to see differences, for instance, in the way that these users like to use apps or, or browse or search for things. So these things are very easy to see. And that's kind of, it, it's a sad thing when you notice that this was designed uh, for a particular set of users. And then there, there's this big part of the users who, who don't necessarily feel that this is designed for them. Um, you know, for instance, being able to read a newsletter in your own language or, or being addressed with your uh, first name or, or your last name first, instead of your first name first, like, you know, this is a localization issue for newsletters and, and all of that kind of email messaging. Uh, so it's easy to see the gaps. Um, and this is why it's really, really um, important to get these three things together. Like Pat mentioned, um, you know, we are designing the product for our user. And the user is our user, no matter where in the world they are and which language they speak. So, so that we need to make sure that we are giving the same kind of level of experience and same level of quality of a product to all our users and kind of don't put them into this kind of language or, or culture um, or tier boxes, so to say. And it's really this cooperation of this kind of these three elements, UX, um, copy and, and localization, where it's from the beginning, the design, design supports different languages and different cultures. It's, it's designed for all users, not just 40%. Uh, and then the rest gets a one-to-one -one translation of, of that product. So this is really important. If you want to really ensure that kind of uh, a global experience or a local experience for all your users, then you really need to bring all of these three elements together uh, and all of these people who, who uh, work towards the same goal. Um, so yeah, that's why I think it's really important. Great, great. And Tart, you alluded obviously to the design element, which is the, the beginning really. And um, Alberto, you're obviously um, coming from a perspective of UX design and, and research. And I'm wondering what's again, from your perspective, 
what why is it important you're looking at it from quite a different uh, angle to a, a localization um a leader for instance so tell us tell us about your perspective design has always been linked to localization in internationalization requirements and adapt cultural adaptation so it's really productive but um i think that one of the the key things that we also have to think of as an industry is really the, the fact that localization teams are often put in a position where they don't feel emancipated enough to bring the feedback or bring the um, requirements that would be necessary for their customers, for the international users to, to the table at an early enough stage. And when companies are more and more obviously moving to digital, moving uh, to in this great initiative now with COVID-19 pandemic with the digital acceleration. International markets are just as important or more important than whatever company the company happens to work in. So I think that we will see the rise of international, internationally minded design or uh, UX um, that is geared towards a global market become more and more prominent. And Alberto, sorry, we, we seem to have a little bit of um, audio issues. I don't know if it's perhaps on my side. You you you, see, you are fading um, every few seconds. Um, I'm, I'm not Mike sure. might be touching his skin and then blocking the voice. Better? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, sorry for interrupting. Okay, sorry. So I was um, just saying that in terms of the current uh, climate, it's obviously more and more a requirement for companies to be uh, designing and exploring the experiences that they are deploying with international market sets um, with a different set of priorities. And I think that localization plays a key role in that. And that's all part of um, a mindset shift as well that we as an industry need to, to consider. The way that localization is pitched a lot of times is, is basically about being um, a delivery method for translations or something that is meant to deploy a specific version of a product. And I don't think that in, in the current uh, climate, it's going to be enough to take us as in the industry and also the, the business strategies that rule the, the international deployment um, far enough. And so part of it is to change the self-view of lock teams and to work more closely with designers and definitely work more upstream, being more involved in those, in those work streams. But also the fact that the localization teams themselves also need to feel that empowered. They need to understand within the context of their limitations and the limitations of the company, and the environment, that they're in, how can they bridge those gaps? How can they actually become, become more acquainted with UX? And I work in research, in UX research. Uh, my team basically deals with research as a block. We deal with every international market as in a, as important a way as possible. So it's very easy to fall in this kind of waterfall um, down trickling kind of um, model where you basically have a massive locale or a massive language or a massive version of something and then everything else is just adaptations and it's convenient and it's definitely something that from a process point of view makes sense but a lot of it starts with the awareness and I think that that's one of the things that companies and localization industry in general need to move forward to and need to feel empowered enough to affect that change and i uh, Basically, that's been also my personal path. I started off as a translator, then moved, as, moved to software localizer, then moved into product management, got transitioned, then eventually into UX research, because um, in order to be close to the customer, that's where it is. It's collecting data directly from the customer. And I think that bringing the localization experience was important in finding out Actually, every market is important. Every market has its own place and has its own requirements. We just need to find a way that as a company or in the, in the industry that we can actually uh, bridge those gaps in an effective way with UX and design and 
effectively serving a product strategy better that way. Great, thank you, Albert. You know, I, I love the idea of the emancipation of the localization industry and sort of self-empowerment. So, and we'll, we'll certainly look at that uh, a little bit more in detail later on. Ryan, you, I mean, to, to the outside world, it seems like you have this figured out already, right? You're, you're managing UX and Not localization. <laughs> uh, what, I mean, obviously, Line and, and uh, you know, yourself and your role already understand that this is critical. Mm. Um, but how did it come about and, and what does uh, your current role look like? Yeah, so uh, at our at our team here at Line, we are definitely have the two integrated UX writing and localization. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to have those two together. Um, it creates a lot of challenges though as well, and those challenges will obviously you know vary depending on what your organization is like. Um, and uh, just to you know to echo some of the thoughts of the other panelists, I agree completely that you know things are getting more more globalized, and everybody wants to conquer the world. Uh, at the same time, they want to do it um, usually in mo in the mobile space, and in the mobile space, you know, you're dealing with uh, very small screens, uh, very limited uh, space, and uh, if you want to meet all these users where they are around the world, you have to consider that in their in their design and then in planning out um, the content that goes in there. So those three th uh, three things are very linked, I think. Um, just a, a little bit about me, yeah, I am. Um, I moved to Korea to teach English. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I thought um, it would be a fun year adventure. I knew I loved language, uh, turned into five years. And I went back to the States and was trying to figure out how to use my Korean skills. And I um, got into uh, gaming. So uh, taking games that were developed in Korea and uh, releasing them in the West. So, um, you know, you have a lot longer time to deal with that. And you actually have a lot more space, a lot more flexibility. It's very fun. Um, but after um, deciding to come back to Korea, I took a position with Line. And Line is an interesting company because our uh, products are actually developed in Korea and Japan um, and serviced mainly in Japan, but we also um, are serviced basically in every country and in uh, 20 languages. And so because I think that it grew out of this uh, way that was sort of like you had, um, you sort of started from an international space uh, the idea of, you know, being prepared for localization was pretty important from the beginning. Um, so it's it's nothing that I personally started to have this, but um, I think it's very wise that our um, company has decided to do it. But, you know, again, uh, there's a lot of challenges as well if you have combining writing and localization. So you have to basically balance, you know, how are you going to do the writing part, which is you want to be very deeply involved in all the aspects of the feature. You want to deeply understand the UX design. You want to deeply understand the content as well and the business needs. And then you also have to balance that with a localization part, which is this actually has to be translated into 20 languages. And if you have a lot of services to manage, like, like our team does, um, you quickly run into resource questions. And how do I actually do this great job for all these languages and still meet what tends to be very tight turnarounds in the mobile space. So that's why I think it's very important to consider these earlier, just like the other panelists have been saying, don't think of it as an afterthought, um, like it often has been, but think about it as an integral part uh, of the design. So yeah, that's my take on it. Great, thank you, Ryan. And Sergio, last but not least, because you represent the, the UX writing piece of this of this jigsaw, of this triad or, or Shamrock, as we had uh, sort of spoken about during some of our previous conversations. From your perspective, from the UX writing, why is it key that the, these elements come together? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I like to say, I told before, Maria Jesus, one day that I feel like the imposter here, imposter here, but I think that that's okay also because I think we all can relate in different stages for the translation process. And as Ryan just said, there is some people who just work in the thing of the localization of the afterthought. That's our case, sadly, but I can, that's why I can see the, the importance. Also because in, in Doctoralia, we're already four US writers. When back in the day, when I started like five years ago, it was only me. And also his writing was an afterthought. Of course, it worked. It was something that may add value. But once you integrate with design, it's completely different. It's the same with, with translation process. Just, just to let you know a little bit about this process for design. Uh, 
I, I like to show always a, a very clear image, which is a, you cannot design a, a package if you don't know what the content, what you want to put inside. That's how you make people realize design and content is to, to work together. And it's the same for localization. You, you don't know where you're going to send this package. You, you, you don't care about localization. You're literally reading the, the message. Ryan was saying it. You, you need to go deeply involved in the content. Why would you do that? Do you just matter for the for the English users and not the rest? You're just destroying your your message for the sake of just let's say saving money, but at the end you're spending more that that you should. So that's literally everything. That uh, ju just a, another thought. We like to always uh, think about user experience, like we we think of the user, and if we don't think it universally, if with that you we, we don't say universal. As Tarja said, if you don't think locally for everyone, then you're just not thinking locally. You're just not thinking for the user. So that would be all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergio. And um, we're going to take a look at who you are and where you are in your journey. Um, Priscilla, could we pull up the poll results? Great. OK, so we have an 85% uh, representing localization, 17% UX writing. Um, UX research and UX design, 6%, and others are 26%. So that's, that's uh, it's great. Welcome, everybody. And we, we are delighted, actually, to, to have um, people representing different different functions. Um, the, the teams that are you currently have in your different uh, companies, localization, 91%, UX writing and UX design, again, quite, quite close, 43% and 38% and UX research 32%. So that's, um, it, it seems to indicate that a majority of companies are quite mature and they do have a specific dedicated functions um, to, to, these, uh, to, to these elements. And in terms of how would you say these teams are collaborating? Um, so it's uh, frequent collaboration at 36%, that's the top, uh, which is it's fantastic to hear. And then followed closely by 32% only in my head for now. So it, it seems to be either like we're up here or we're kind of, you know, at the very early stages. Um, 30% there's like touch collaboration. So it's it's great again that, that this, this concept is not new, but it's sort of evolving. And as we said, it's just accelerated um, again by, by the kind of the global circumstances. Um, and in terms of what would you like to get, to, sorry, what you would like to get out of today? So for the most part, learn what the ideal world UX would look like, which we're going to talk about in, in just a second, and hear real, real life insights and learn about the concept. And obviously, um, a lot of you are already well underway in terms of this journey and your awareness. And um, we're not... Um, I guess this is not a masterclass as, as such, um, but we're sharing experiences and, and the panelists are sort of sharing their thinking. And hopefully this is going to trigger thoughts and, and give you some ideas that you can bring with you and, and implement um, with your own teams and, and with your own companies. So as, as I mentioned, we're, we're going to look now like, OK, so we've determined we're all we're all in agreement. They need to these uh, functions need to work together, need to integrate and collaborate and um, to achieve what and what does that world UX look like? And Tarja, you and I have spoken about international UX and CX in the past. And and I'm just, you know, from your perspective, I'm, I'm curious to hear what do you feel or how do you envision this world UX? Um, yeah, about the ideal uh, world UX, how would it be, um, how, how is it done, <laughs> I guess is a, is a really good question. I think that first of all, you kind of need to think about how broadly are you looking at it? Um, you know, there are many interpretations of, of UX, for instance, like what, it, what does it mean in your company? Are you, are you at a stage where you can actually start, uh, are you mature enough that you can, you can start looking at the whole journey and the big picture, or maybe you're at a stage where looking at the big picture is too overwhelming, so you would just need to start looking at something. Um, I mean, wherever you are, that's, that's uh, you, you just, yeah, basically you just need to start somewhere. Um, the challenge is that it's, it's a really broad concept, but if you can just narrow down on, like, if you're, if you're new to looking at this kind of localization UX uh, cooperation, then narrowing it down to 
a starting point would be a really good starting point. Uh, <laughs> and really um, creating this kind of mind shift, I think, is really important that I'm always trying to, in, in my uh, teams that I've worked with, try to kind of bring this uh, mind shift where we're not looking at uh, these things. OK, if you get them to work together, you still might consider them separate things. So that's kind of the mind shift needs to happen that you're working on the same same product, same goal, the same content in a way. Um, it's, so it's not a translation, it's copy for your international users. It, it's Italian copy, it's Finnish copy, it's Japanese copy, it's not a translation. That's kind of a really good starting point, kind of making that mind shift happen. Um, as soon as you start, think, start thinking about um, the translation process as, you know, the source and the translation, then you're already in that mind shift thinking about the copy for the user. And that, that's a really good starting point. Um, but, you know, I, like we, we've discussed in this group that it's, you know, no one has it perfectly worked out. Um, and, and this is something that I think is really useful that um, when you start establishing a team, you try things out. It doesn't necessarily, the first thing never works. You know, the, the second thing might not work, uh, but the third thing might already be towards the, the common goal. And, and as with everything, communication is really, really key. Um, once you get these three um, functions discussing, uh, discussing in, you know, sitting in the same table, you were very quickly in my experience realize that you are really, really just talking about the same thing, but with different terminology. Um, I just, you know, as this anecdote from, from my past where, I, where I've had this kind of a dream team, a kind of a solution was um, quite like, like Ryan has, uh, but maybe it's like with a slight difference is that we you used to have this uh, localization team that I was running where the localization, uh, they were called localization designers and they had this dual role where you would 50% uh, of your time, you would write the copy in English. Uh, and then 50% of the time you would localize uh, that copy. You would manage localization for your own copy. So what that really made us do is that we would, when we started writing, we would work with the UX designers, working on the, the cultural specifics and the details and reviewing the UX designs and then coming up with the, with the copy for that design. We already had that kind of mind shift that, well, I can't write this, this won't, this won't be localized very well or this will not work. And, you know, we need to simplify. This is really nice copy for in English, but, you know, not all our users are, are native English speakers, for instance. So that was a really nice team. And, and we explored with that, um, that uh, for a while and it was working great. But then, like Brian mentioned, <laughs> that then there's come this, um, it comes a time when, when that doesn't scale anymore. Uh, and it's really difficult. You, you cannot just um, start a team like that because, you know, these are kind of unicorns that you're looking for if you want to have a person uh, who can at the same time write UX copy and then you can, is also a, an expert in localization. So how do you write that uh, job description uh, or that, uh, yeah, that job ad? So it's a, it's a tricky thing. And I was saying uh, earlier in, in our discussions uh, with this group that I'm not sure if this was the best solution. It was the best solution that we had, but maybe that's not something that can be scaled or, or um, like recreate it quite easily. But yeah, I think it's it's determining where what is your starting point and what are the resources that you, resources that you can use and, and then start communicating sitting at the same table. Okay, great. And I like the like I like the, the thinking that I mean there's no one size fits all, there's no one single world UX. It's it's what's going to work for your particular product service. Um, and, and company and, and set up as well. Pat, you've been on this journey for, for the last while. Um, what's, what's your vision ultimately for what World UX should look like? Um, I'm kind of surprised by so many localization people on this on this call, actually. It's, I'm just thinking, should I change my answers? Um, so for me, translation. Uh, I mean, we all know. So translation happens at the end of the process, really. Uh, you can't translate anything until you have a file or until there's content in a file. But there is a role for the for the localization at the start. So at the start, when you have UX and then you have the writers join in and they add the content to the design, this is the conception of your solution. And that's when localization should come in and give the feedback and give the worldview. And that's what we've done in our teams. Um, some, something concrete you could say is 
our designers, they design on Envision and the writers have worked on everything. And then on Slack, we get these requests, these, these designs, links to designs go up there and we look at it and we give the localization feedback and they'll take that on board. And sometimes if it's a big issue, there might be meetings. Otherwise they just take it on and they make the changes. And so it's easier and cheaper to fix something when it's in the design phase rather than after it's coded, after it's released, after the, local, the, the users have seen it. Um, so in the ideal world for me, we have this triad. It's, it's the, the shamrock you mentioned that, that makes sense to the Irish. It's, it's one shamrock, three leaves. So it's three groups content right writers and localization and together they, they they work on these designs to fix it at the start um they should be in my mind part of the same organization preferably ux because ux are going to work on everything at the start uh so they're going to be sitting together probably embedded in the same product teams they share the designs they take the feedback you might have something like a style guide that's been written in common, you know, the UX and the writers and the look. So everybody has feedback in there on specific things and it guides everyone. So that's something else we've got. Um, essentially, you're looking to learn everyone's processes and methods and ph ph philosophies uh, of your co uh, workers, I guess. Um, look for the advantages, the shortfalls you're going to maybe have to fill in a gap that they're not even aware exists and they'll do the same for you. And I think that in our industry, since we're always learning or always expected to learn new skills anyway, um, it's not unreasonable to say, right, well, I'm going to learn the skills of the others. Um, so learn a bit about UX and what's involved and learn how to, to write, take some online courses, um, how, to, how, to, how to write good copy for UI. And that way then everybody's able to speak each other's language and, and really be on the same wavelength and, and, and increase your, your chance of success when working on designs and communicating with each other. Um, and I suppose the, the one caveat is you still need your localization at the end, your translation bit at the end. Um, so it's not a, a contradiction to say we need localizers at the start. You need them at both ends um, for the design and then to implement it at the end in translation. So um, I think what we're saying is, or what I'm saying is that localization in a lot of places is missing at the start and it needs to be, it's missing in the considerations, it's missing in content considerations and it ideally it should be added to the start. So that's what the ideal world for me is, get it added at the start. Great, thank you and I think that you know the, the being at the beginning and, and being at the end the kind of um sort of self empowering as well which ties in with Silberto's concept from from earlier and saying I, I want to be involved in these and and learning to speak the the other functions language as well I think Tarja maybe in some of our previous conversations you, you were saying you, that you had to stop talking about internationalization and globalization and things like that you, you started really talking your the, the UX teams um, language which kind of created that kind of closer um, alignment and, and you know maybe maybe less of a, a disconnect because as you said at the end of the day you're talking about the same thing. And as you alluded earlier, they start from different places. They have the same destination. So that's to keep in mind. So here, from your perspective, and, and we appreciate you're not an imposter by, by any means, um, but we appreciate that you're in a different place in the journey um, as a company and also come at it from a different perspective. What is your vision, vision Sorry for um, World UX? Short answer would be, I don't know. I think that that's okay also, because I also know that everything that I don't know, that I know is not working. So as I said, you need to try everything for yourself. There is nothing that fits everyone, but you will need, you will need to try that. In our case, for example, we, have the, we don't have localization managers, either localization designers. It's as the US writers who also do the translation. But that's also okay for, for small, medium-sized companies, if it, that's your case. I think it's good, at least I like to see it that way, because it, as we are in the first step with the design people, we also see the struggle with localization because it's ourselves who translate. So at the beginning, it didn't happen when I just was designing an interface. I was just coming with crazy ideas or something that just sound very good in English. And it's like, oh, fuck, I need to translate that to Spanish. And that was me. So it's like, I, I could feel the pain in, in myself. 
there's no, no, there's no third person that will suffer it, it's, it's myself. Then it's like, okay, and, and it happened to the four of us, the four years writers. So once you realize that that is a problem that you need to work on it, you, you will see it for sure that's something very important and you will, you will not only realize what you need to do, but you will also try to try to do it. And something that I think is uh, crucial here, it's as, as Pat said, is, is a collaboration. You will either will need to think of a process of how to do it, either it's yourself or with more people. But after that, you need to either start a collaboration or spark collaboration. It may be you, the one who, who starts it, but also try to, to finalize. Uh, you, you will find them for sure. In, we are just world people, worse people, and I think we are very, we, we love empathy. So at the end, we are on the same boat and we love the, we have the same goal. So I think it's gonna be easier to, to find that people. In my case, uh, I can talk about it later, but it can be even a developer. We like to think of them as people who is outside of our, of our process, but it shouldn't be the case. They, they are also in the same, in the same board of us and we will see it in a minute why, how they can also participate with us. Great, great. Thank you, Sergio. Ryan, we're not going to ask you whether you guys have achieved Panacea and you have achieved the ideal perfect world UX, but, I, but what's your vision for it? Perhaps maybe you can help us with that. Yeah, I think um, I think it comes down to a th something that's come out from a lot of the answers, which is collaboration. It has to be collaborative. And I think that, that you know, it doesn't matter on on how the actual form of what you're doing takes place, as long as there's that collaboration. And that collaboration is really understanding uh, each other's needs. Uh, so something that I think gets lost sometimes when you're thinking about localization is um, not really thinking about it in terms of what you're, what the, as trying to fulfill a need, but in, in terms of taking text and then just like getting it into all these other languages, right? So um, I think a good way is to have discussions around the needs of the text, uh, the needs of the, the writing, the needs of each piece of the design, in fact. So um, that can, can help not only the people that you're working with to collaborate, understand what you are trying to do and, and the information you need, the context to do your job, but also helps you understand their perspective, right? So like, for example, is there a KPI we're trying to achieve with this piece of text? Are we trying to get users to click it? Are we trying to boost some sort of, you know, KPI on the back end that we're not aware of? That might help us write a better text for it. Is it more important to warn the user because of some legal reason or because of, of something like that? You know, there's usually oftentimes a reason uh, for something that happens in the design that if the writers aren't deeply embedded, they might not have that context. So being able to collaborate to get that context is most important. Um, you know, ideally, you can have one person just do everything, but that's pretty not really ideal. So the next best step is to have an embedded uh, team sort of um, kind of like Tarja was saying, um, basically have them kind of do jack of all trades sort of things and then be very deeply design uh, into the design with the teams uh, sitting together. Uh, I think 4% of the respondents said they had deep integration. That's what I would consider uh, an ideal, but it's really hard to do at scale. It's really hard to do uh, and balance those other challenge I mentioned before. So the next thing, best thing is you just have to have that collaboration. Uh, you have to be on the same page with who you're working with. Um, and that means like speaking the same language, I guess. So um, however you can achieve that, it's gonna, it's gonna make, make things work, I think. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Alberto, is there anything from a UX design perspective for research that you would like to add to that vision for a, an ideal or the, the kind of the perfect storm, the perfect world UX? Uh, yeah, so basically this, there's been a, quite a number of principles already enumerated, which are key, but I think that ultimately what we're all discussing and um, in terms of what we're actually um, aiming for in terms of world UX, that those principles of collaboration, of embedding, of constant communication, of understanding what are the needs and requirements of the user and the people who are actually going to use the product it all speaks ultimately to the fact that localization is UX and we have a um, responsibility in terms of the whatever we put in front of our users across markets to make the, that experience uh, work towards whatever their requirements are. 
And so that's the, the thing with uh, UX design and research is that they are not always natively aware of localization and building those bridges definitely helps. And in terms of um, world UX, and there's a key distinction as well, is that there isn't a universal UX in the sense that it's never one thing that can serve everybody in the world, that's impossible. But we should think of UX with a universal in mind. We should think of it as something that should be inclusive, that should be accessible and should be uh, targeting the appropriate audiences. Um, in a way that is very close to what they actually require. So obviously me working in research, my team is very, very connected to the design and localization parts because whenever we test, for example, a product across uh, different markets, that's basically what we're looking at is how do we um, how do we think about the user in that specific circumstance in that specific market? And so usually, pairing up and collaborating on the on that level of being very connected to not just design and localization and research and have that triad really supported also by whatever is coming from QA, whatever is coming from feedback in the markets, whatever is coming, whatever can be gleaned as well from the tests and the research that we do. Um, it's important that the localization um, part is an inherent um, component of UX and that's the aspect where what kind of form that will take will depend on the corporate environment, will depend on team makeup. Uh, I think that's really what Ryan and Tanya were alluding to in terms of collaboration is key because unicorns are very, very few. And if you can use the resources you have in-house effectively, then that's half the battle because bringing people in is really what, again, what world UX speaks to is being inclusive and also having that uh, translate into the way that you work. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto. So we've we've looked at the why they belong together um, and, and the, the what world UX or the ideal world UX may look like, even though there isn't such a thing as universal UX or sort of the, the perfect um, world UX. I'd, I'd like us to look at how do we get from where we are today to that ideal right to, to where we want to be um maybe some of the challenges that you guys have experienced throughout your your own journeys and i i would love to hear also from our attendees from our audience today just put in the chat rather than the, in the q a but if you could put in the chat kind of in in one word or two what is your major challenge um today and I, i'm going to turn to ryan just in terms of the, the challenges that you have experienced over over the last number of years in your role at line um, and how you've overcome them what advice you would give um our, our audience be it on the localization side or on the ux side to kind of progress through this journey towards a world ux yeah sure um obviously the challenge i mentioned earlier about doing things at scale is something that um, I think is a, a big challenge. And the way to do that is just cons consistently innovate and try to find ways to automate things. So, you know, on my team, I have like three awesome PMs and five writers, and they're constantly giving new ideas about how we can improve parts of the process, automate certain tasks. Um, if you can have a localization engineer, uh, that's amazing. We tried to hire one for a long time, couldn't find one. Uh, so we're trying to do it all basically um, as we can. But that will really help. Uh, the other thing is keeping people on the same page about what your role is. Um, I saw one of the people asked a questions about um, working with teams that might be resistant to integration. And I think uh, being very clear about what your role is and what you're bringing to the team is um, something that's a constant challenge. Um, even if you can get people on the same page, new people will come in to the company. Um, a lot of places, it's not integrated well. So they might have a different idea of what your role should be. So explaining what you're doing and, and doing a sort of self-advocacy is actually a constant challenge that, that we have to do um, even here with like, this is why we're localizing, this is what we're doing. You know, we're not just a simple translation team. We're actually writing and we're taking the needs of the business into consideration. All those very basic things. It's basically like constantly having to like teach people what the localization is and what uh, we do. So that, I think that's a never ending challenge for the job. So if you get started down this road, just be prepared for that. 
Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Tarja, from your perspective, again, you have been managing the sort of kind of cross-functional teams for quite some time. What challenges have you faced? What, I guess, what would be your um, top advisor or top tips? I think that's uh, it, definitely one of the challenges for uh, for me in the past has been uh, kind of, you know, getting, uh, first of all, getting the understanding to to the other teams of what localization is and what does what are the things that the localization manager is actually interested in in uh, because you know usually the, the the idea is that you are interested in in the translations and and and, and the languages and and you know, producing a, a language version but you know there, there are so many things that we've covered here you know there's so much data that you have to uh, follow on a daily basis basically when you're a localization manager and, and all of these different things that you kind of have to be aware of all the different things that the other people in the company are doing. You have to understand what developers are doing and, and kind of speak all of everyone's language. Um, but the biggest challenge has probably been, you know, as you're trying to create ROI for your, for your languages that you're managing and, and kind of create ROI for localization and, and, and producing quality localization, it's really difficult if, if you know, uh, if the research is done, for instance, just with the English text, and then decisions are made based on that kind of um, feedback that you get from English users, and then you try to just translate that into, into other languages. So kind of getting that understanding of, you know, what a localization, what localization means in a broader sense, that's probably, probably it. Um, but also it's, I think that usually getting this kind of Collaboration has been has been easy. I, I like to harness technology to, to help in, in the challenges. Uh, you know, what, when talking about collaborating with writers and with UX uh, UX uh, design teams, usually there's this um, this piece of technology that you can put in the middle that will get people excited about working with localization, for instance, and it will make it easy because there's this kind of this underlying thought. Even if you haven't really been working with localization, it's the same with dev development teams. There's this kind of weird um, thing, thinking that localization is difficult and localization is um, it's slow and it slows things down, and that's usually as a result of you know not having the right technology in place in your company to to collaborate. So usually, what I've done to overcome these challenges um, with the with the collaboration is just to find those processes and find the tools that that will make the process work. For instance, uh, using a design tool where you can push strings directly into your localization management tool. Those kind of things that will make the, uh, the that will kind of leave time for thinking. You know, when you when you take out those kind of tedious tasks from the from the middle. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tarja. Sergio, um, from your perspective, I think uh, at some point in our in our previous conversations, you had talked about. Um, sort of the the challenge first of all to bring design and writing together and now you had achieved some sort of technology as well that had uh, helped with that further collaboration and sort of automation and streamlining would you like to share with us yeah yeah sure i started by just saying there's people who think that translation is just slow processes and we just discovered by ourselves because we we didn't know about it that is quite the opposite we just just to let you know about our background we started back in the day with spreadsheet with screenshots which is like, okay, it's to get the job done, but of course not the way to go. And then we just, I remember going one year ago to other meetups to know about it, how to improve this process. And of course, there's a, a long way for that. But then we just moved to, to Trello, just for asking for translations, to give context, where are the users that's gonna read that and everything else. So, okay, we're, we're improving. And then when I was talking about the developer that helped us, there was a developer in, in our team who said, hey, I just read documentation about Fraser, which is a content management system to enter translations. And he said, do you think we could uh, make a, a collaboration between Figma and Fraser? And I was like, well, I, did, I, mean, I didn't know about that. It, it looked super hard back in the day, uh, and it wasn't. And, and right now we have a, a system in which we can, either the US writers or people who is translating, just translate everything in Figma, which is, you, you can see that really how it's gonna, how it's gonna be seen for, for users. And then we just literally two, three clicks. You just send it to, to Fraser, to the content management system. And it helps for sure. It helps us and it helps developers also. And what's more important is that it helps users because you can see from the very beginning how it's gonna be seen. And, and it's one of the tiny things with technology that as Tarja was saying, it, it may seem like, oh my God, this is impossible to achieve. And it's doable. I think one of the, one of the biggest key challenges is that you need to, to spot 
you can see it, uh, fuck ups or the, the spots for improvement in your in your process. I think we all suffer them, but we somehow we, we don't spot them. I, I would recommend you to try to spot them and just uh, section them like, okay, these are my problems here. And once you have them spotted, you will maybe you will know directly what to do, but you, you will know what to address and just go one by one. And as we said before, uh, step by step, try to work for you. And if not, just move to the other one, but for sure it's gonna be an improvement. Okay, great. So trailer for collaboration and then uh, Figma and Phrase app in terms of what you guys are utilizing. I think at some point in our previous conversations, Slack was kind of one of the channels for collaboration. Um, that, that you guys have mentioned as well. So that's great. And I, I see that there's a lot of questions. I know that we're running a little bit behind. So um, Alberto, I'm, I'm going to get you to um, share perhaps some of your own experience again, coming at it from a design perspective or a research perspective, What have how you've overcome them or what sort of advice would you give to our audience to get from where they are today to where they want to be? Yeah. So um, in my personal path um obviously coming from localization there was a certain set of skills that i had to acquire in order to move into design and then research and it's really um i find that localization people are naturally curious they have this kind of uh, vision to learn and to improve their skills and, and acquire that's that's with knife I think that one of the things that definitely helps is to um, take online courses, for instance, like Interaction Design Foundation has quite a few that are very accessible, they're for free, and they are very helpful in understanding the basics of UX. Also, in terms of the, the basic skills, you even if you're not aiming to become a unicorn, it's just important to understand some of the, the basics of layout and design. And if you're working in localization for a while, you've developed an eye for that for sure. You've got internationalization concerns, um, different aspects of wrapping and, and different aspects of uh, potential issues with long strings. And this is all, these are all things that can help in, in collaborating and discussing these issues with design teams. But uh, again, the, principle being that localization doesn't exist in a vacuum. There's an environment around it. If the team doesn't have access to UX writing as such, it means that usually the, the copywriters or whoever is managing the, the content might need also some assistance from a data uh, perspective. And it's good to engage, for example, with if you, even if you're building a business case or if you're just thinking about how to take the next step towards, you know, um, emancipating localization in your environment. It's good to look at analytics, for example, for specific markets, um, seeing what the traffic is like, engage in those kinds of conversations because you can definitely use those to your advantage in making the case for more investment or more um, capacity for, for the team. And the other thing as well is obviously um, in research, we're usually doing user testing uh, which is a very simple way of getting somebody from that speaks a different language um, sitting in front of even a pseudo localized prototype or a different version of the product and getting feedback that way. And that usually brings to light a lot of design issues that then are naturally um, relevant for the UX teams. But also it starts off this conversation on the other level, which is, um, any user of any market is going to have a response and sometimes just showing video clips and bringing that to the conversation within the, the teams really, really helps to build awareness and more um, and, a, and a more uh, prominent role for localization. So there are different angles that you can, can, you can latch on. On a personal level, definitely um, taking some courses and getting into it by yourself, but also hopefully getting the company to sponsor you on that. And also on a team level, engaging with research, making the case of uh, localization as another component of UX um, really does help, but it's always reliant on persistence as well. You have to be patient in some cases. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Alberto. I know we're running over time, but Pat, I'd be I'd be very keen to hear what, what you have to say. And I know in, in some of our previous conversations, we were talking about at the end of the day, you know, money and securing 
budget and kind of getting leadership buy-in and all of those things. Um, so from, from your experience, again, how, um, what, what sort of advice would you give? What sort of challenges you have experienced? What strategies have you applied? Yeah, um, I, the first thing actually I'm going to address is I saw a question come up about writing. Um, mm-hmm. Someone didn't have uh, writers and I think they were getting texts from PMs or POs and it was poor quality. And so this is something I faced. So I'm going to answer that question specifically and then go right. back. Um, first thing is if you Google controlled natural languages and try to create something like that in your own limited way in work. So a controlled natural language is, um, it's like a subset of English. Um, and phrases are uh, basically structured in a certain way and everybody learns them. So if you ever watch TV and you see a captain on a ship, a modern day ship speaking to some other captain, um, they, they, they all have to learn this maritime English. So they all say things the exact same way so that if you're not a native speaker, but you've learned this version of English, then you understand each other. And the reason for that is back in, I think, the 70s or the early 80s, there was a flip. Up before that, like 70% of the crews on ships with international trade were all English speaking. And then it flipped over and then they were mainly international. But they all had to communicate each other with each other when they were passing each other in the straits of wherever. And so you've got this and you've got it in aviation and in weapons technology, where you have all these people who work in different countries, but they all have to communicate with the same language. And, and, and it, this controls how they write stuff. So they might write a sentence where it's allowed to say, you can close a circuit, you can close a door, but they say, but you're not allowed to say, don't stand close to the engine. They'd say, don't stand near the engine. So there's actually software out there that will pass through your text and say, you don't say it that way, you say it this way, and then that's acceptable. And so that then removes confusion in text. Now, that might be too far for, for any of us, but the point is if you get an understanding of how this works, um, you can start to um, put restrictions on yourself and how things are said uh, and how to restructure sentences so that it makes more sense and um, there's a pattern that you follow afterwards. So that's the first thing, controlled natural languages. And the second thing is um, readability scores. So you can get certain websites and Microsoft Word does this as well. If you go into you know, the grammar and all that and you turn everything on, there's a particular option. You get a score for your text when you run the, uh, the spell check. And this will convince your PM or your product owner if the text is good or bad. This isn't an opinion, this is an algorithm and it's used internationally. And it gives you a score and whatever it is, like 70 or something, anything below that is below the minimum and it's, it's really very poor. So if, if, if they give you text and they say, this is great and you think this is rubbish, you can get a score and say, look at this score, this is really poor, but I've rewritten it and now this is a good score then at least that's factual information you can come back with. It's not an opinion, you know, it's, 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 it's a number. So that's another thing. Um, related to the controlled natural language, there's a, there's a book written by a guy on this called Globish and he has a site. So it's G-L-O-B-L-I-S-H, Globish. And it's, it's basically, it's a business English, but the idea is, um, English language reduced to the most common 1500 words. And if you put your text in there and anything beyond the most common words, uh, it flags them. Now, if it's a technology terminology thing in your industry, you can keep it. But if it's a complicated word, you could find a simpler version and then bring your re- reading level down to a simpler level and it's, it's easier. Hemingway is another site. You put stuff in there, it flags things that are uh, in the passive uh, voice rather than the active, all those kind of things. And it's all ways of, of, of fixing up quality uh, of your text if, if you think it's poor. Uh, this, before, we ha- before I had writers working with me, this is the sort of stuff I had to check into and to try and Im- improve the quality of my source because some of what I was getting was, was very poor. So that's just that, that answer there. Um, right. going back to the, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Go no, on. no, go ahead. Go ahead. We're just, um, we're a little over time. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, no worries. Thank you. 
Um, for me, uh, in localization, when I was in Microsoft, there was a tipping point. They started to make more money from the non-English product than from the English product. And so companies are going to get that. Um, if, if, if they think localization is just translation at the end, uh, it's been you're underestimating it. It really needs to be there and it really needs to be taken that um, your future could be with the, your non-native or uh, language. So you really got to go out there and, and, and spread it around. Um, on a personal level, there's no magic bullet for this. The person has to go out and look for access to designs if they're not getting it. Explain the problems, explain how you're going to fix it. Uh, you got to chase it up. Um, it's just down to the person. And I'll leave it at that. I'll just leave it at that. That's great. No, I appreciate, really appreciate it. And the, the fact that we've run over time, it means that this is, this is, uh, it's, it's not only a, a hot topic, it's something just genuinely, this is where our industry, where the localization industry needs to be. This is where World UX needs to, needs to go. And um, I'm afraid we're not going to have time to answer all of the questions. We've alluded to some of the questions in the Q&A. Um, what I would like to commit to, and I'm sure the panelists will, will be very happy to oblige, is that we're going to take the questions and answers, guys, and we're going to answer them. When you get the link to the recording for today's session, you will get the answers, our answers as well to to the questions i think that it's fair enough for for everybody um and i obviously I, I would like to see and actually we are going to have a follow-up um to to today's uh, round table we're going to have a, a workshop a more kind of deep dive um more sort of practical workshop on world ux in the new year so stay tuned we will uh, confirm date and, and details um in the coming in the coming weeks um but in the meantime you know feel free to connect with the panelists with myself you know kind of continue the conversation there is a lot of momentum there, there is a clear need and and um yeah all all that's left for me is to thank the panelists so much for for their time for generously sharing their time for ryan especially you're on the other side of the world so it's uh <laughs> past midnight if i've done my maths right um yeah. And yeah, I just very much look forward to, to kind of sharing um, such a deep conversation with you guys again. Thank you to the attendees. Thank you to everybody who has stayed with us um, for, for the uh, slightly over the, the 60 minute mark. And um, yes, we will for sure um, reply to your questions, uh, continue to share kind of a spread experience, share the knowledge and, uh, and move things forward. So thank you very much. And Priscilla, I think I'll hand it over to you to close the round table. Everyone. So thank you so much, Maria. And of course, if you'd like to go back and listen to this round table, uh, the recording will be available in the coming days on the vistatech.com website and sent to anyone who registered for today's event. And as Maria mentioned, if we didn't get to answer your questions today, we saw that we had a lot of questions, which is fantastic uh, and not, uh, not surprising. Of course, we'll make sure to answer them in our full web session. Um, of course, I'd like to thank all of our panelists today, Alberto, Tarja, Pat, Ryan and Sergio and Maria. Uh, for a really insightful discussion and uh, thank you everyone for joining us. This roundtable has now come to a close.